-hmm. If the staff knows more than the judge is making a decision, we're in trouble. Alex here with a perspectives video on competence and demeanor. Donna Wilburn, a licensed marriage and family therapist with Red Rock Counseling, is going to be interviewing family law attorney Jason Stoffel, who is running for Department T of the 8th Judicial District Court. Let's take a look. Hi, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you coming in so much, like taking all your time to, to come in and talk to me. So I want to... Um, talk about, get to get to know you a little bit, get right. to know you as the candidate that you're looking for. So just to let everyone know, I'm Donna Wilburn, licensed marriage and family therapist, and I work with high conflict divorce situations and the court system and, and the evaluations and all like that I have for about 15 years now. So we've come across each other in that, in that realm a bit and got to know you a bit in there. So First, how about introduce yourself, what position are you running for, and what do you think you want to bring to the to the bench that's better than what we have? Gotcha. Well, my name is Jason Stoffel. been a family court attorney, a family law attorney for 16 years. I say family law attorney because I'm not just an attorney that does everything. Mm -hmm. This is what I do. Since day one, 99% of my practice has been in the area of family law, and I live and breathe this stuff. Uh, other things the State Bar Convention or the Family Law Convention, I've gone to that every single year. Okay. I'm proud of that because that's what I do. It helps me stay abreast of changes in the law, helps me be a better attorney to clients, and that's also good. Uh, what I'm running for is Family Court Judge Department T. There's a retiring judge in that particular department, uh, so there will be a new judge. It makes it fair for all the candidates that are going for an open seat, as they're called. That makes it all the better. Okay. So I'm running in that race because I think I'm the best candidate, which I, th I believe I am and I know I am. I have the most experience, I have the judicial demeanor, I also have judicial experience. Since 2017, I've been a pro tem judge for the city of Las Vegas, sitting in the small claims. Uh, that is interesting. There <laughs> is are it, some horrible landlords in town, who knew? Is it worse than family court? More it, dramatic than family court? I don't know. It can be. I mean, really? one afternoon we spent on what is the cost of a used toilet that was stolen. Landlord, the afternoon? Yes. Landlord-tenant disputes, prisoner rights, uh, some small claim, you know, you know, credit card stuff. It's a different, you know, dynamic. People have a lot to say. Right. People have exhibits and you have to look at this stuff. And when you know someone is just crazy or lying, you still have to give them the benefit of the doubt. You might see an attorney that is in front of you and you might not think too much of the attorney, but you have to put that aside. It's what the law says, what the facts, you know, suggest uh, doing that. Also for six years, I was a truancy diversion judge for uh, the 8th Judicial District Court. So uh, that's with the kids who yes. aren't going to school, so then you had to interact with the kids and their families most, like that? Most definitely. Okay. For six years, every Friday, donating my time, that's okay. important to me. You figure out why kids are doing what they're doing, which is, it starts off with truancy, but with truancy, you figure out why that is. Truancy, I believe, is a gateway crime. I want to know why my kids are skipping school, doing drugs, having sex, joining gangs, and I learn. I learn a lot from these families that come in and some of the teachers that come in, they say, we can tell when it's dad's week because the kids are ungroomed oh. and this and that or late. We can tell when it's mom's week or vice versa. And I've seen it both ways. That's not something that you get unless you're in a position of authority, which is, is helpful to do. Uh, other things about me, I'm a big advocate for Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, giving back. Could I be making more money? Absolutely. But when someone comes into my office or I get a referral from the Legal Aid Center, I want to make sure I do everything I can to take those cases. Right. I've been recognized as pro bono attorney of the year, and my law firm, Robert Stoffel Family Law Group, has been small firm of the year. Oh, this um, has it? it That's, I, yes, yes. I did not know they even had that designation. We do it's have the designation, and uh, they, they gave us that award uh, a while back, but uh, it's still so, there. So let me ask you a question. So you were saying, and this is interesting, working with the truancy diversion mm -hmm. and looking at the families and getting to know the dynamics and factors that influence these kids, and you've seen, you know, the high conflict divorce or parents who are uncooperative with each other. Right. So how do you bring that knowledge to the bench to work with these high conflict divorce cases? Like what insight does it give you that is different than someone who hasn't had that experience when you have these, these extremely dramatic upset people in front of you, what, what kind of insight is different for you? The most important thing that I would bring to the bench is being prepared. There's never an acceptable way to say, what are we here for today? Do you have two kids, no kids? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. 
you have to know what's going on. So the first thing is read the pleadings. When you read the pleadings, as simple as that sounds, you get to know the family. Do you think there's and some people who don't really read the pleadings as much as they can? I, I do, I do. And I think some of those judges are not seeking re-election. Yeah. And I also think some of the judges that do it rely heavily on their staff. Mm -hmm. If the staff knows more than the judge is making a decision, we're in trouble. Clark County deserves better. So as far as, you know, one of my things I want to bring to the bench is not only being prepared, but the judicial demeanor. We see cases where you can see like Judge Judy type stuff, like a fight ready to just brew. Mm -hmm. If you put your hands out and say, look, I'm in charge, you'll get your turn. Mm -hmm. It's respect. It's not just a little, you know, sign on the side of the, of the door when you walk in to say we expect civility and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You have to have it. And if you don't, it's a kangaroo court. So you get to learn these families. So do you have to be strong enough to manage the courtroom so a fight doesn't happen? Yes. And then like how you have to, like it's, to me it's almost impossible to try to address the concerns of everybody. It's hard, it's difficult, but if nothing else, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm taking this matter, this issue under advisement. You want to rule on law and facts, not emotion. Mm -hmm. There are some of the best judges of family court if you see they're at a boiling point, they'll say, we'll take five and they will walk off the bench. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, we're gonna recess this case, perhaps the two parties, with, if there's two attorneys, they're talking. You wanna also recognize civility and safety concerns because we see too often where sometimes there's a pro per representing themselves and someone with an attorney. Mm -hmm. You see bullying going on. You see like, I'm an attorney, I'm all special with my pink tie or whatever, mm -hmm. and I wanna get the leg up. Mm -hmm. Yet, bias has no place in the courtroom. You have to be treated equally with dignity and respect. I see it too often, and usually it's the other way around. And what I mean by that is some pro pers get away with everything. Oh. They file things late. They say whatever. My best friend's sister's boyfriend, girlfriend once told me, I'm a, uh, objection, quadruple hearsay, we'll let it in. Mm. Why is there a different standard? So that's why it's like, well, why did I go to school and you know, get this education if I'm gonna get walked over by a judge who just says, well, we'll let it in. Rules that apply to even, everyone. Yeah, they have to follow the rules also. Right. And that's interesting because you were talking about if the judge recognizes they're getting emotional, they should step away because they're I not going to be as logical. So that's something that you're aware of and that you would take into consideration as you're working with a high conflict case. Yes, most definitely. That you have no problem stepping away and, and saying, I'm, I'm not deciding this at the moment. Absolutely. And then the easiest way is just under advisement. Just say, saying that so they're done, they're not waiting around for you. Because if you call another case and then you come back and you're like, oh man, this is the same thing. I'm still going to need a break. Right. If you need a breather. And sometimes it's just a simple issue whether we need this additional service or perhaps if it's a relocation case, do we have to have an expert or should we recommend an expert to get involved to do some sort of risk assessment? Right. These are all things that are necessary because oftentimes you get cases where there's so much emotion in that courtroom, you want to make the best decision, not the most popular decision. Right, right. And that's, that can be challenging if you're affected by their feelings. Most and definitely. Let, it, let their intensity rattle you. Right, right. And, and so are you saying like, you can resist that because I've seen some get flustered. Correct. If people are getting overly upset and emotional, the court may get, the judge may get flustered and then, you know, their decision making gets affected by that. Right. That's hard. It is hard, but some of the things you can do is to, efficiency is another thing I want to bring to the bench. Mm -hmm. If you've got three at nine, three hearings at 10, three at 11, they should be 20 minute hearings. I am sick and tired of showing up to a 10 o'clock hearing at 9.50 and I don't go till 12.10. Oh my goodness. It happens too much. Some of the best judges, and I won't name drop, will, when a hearing starts, I've read it, anything else? Five words. That's helpful because it tells you, one, I'm ready to roll. I've read everything. If someone got a DUI in the last three days, I wanna hear about that. Mm -hmm. But don't tell me, judge, as you read on page 10, don't insult my intelligence. I've read it, anything else. So that is an effective way to manage business. And in some cases, if the issue is so black and white, render a, a minute order you know and then be done with it you don't have to have a hearing for a very simple a, a simple thing simplicity is overlooked sometimes doesn't that save the client or the party's money it does do it does but some people want their day in court and i understand that the, especially in the child custody matter you don't want to sound like my mind's already you know made up i'm or or get the uh, uh label of i'm a pro dad or pro mom or every case joint custody regardless of the facts because i'm flipping coins in chambers and you know rendering <laughs> right. decisions that way People have to feel that they've been heard and they have to you know, certainly brief it. We expect good quality briefs. We expect, you know, not to say, 
I'm a good mom or I'm a good dad, and I'll tell you why the day of court. I do not want to learn anything new on the day of a hearing. I want to clarify gray areas. I want to ask, well, what is your work schedule? What is the time share? Mm -hmm. What is your best argument? Don't tell me I win because I said so, or mm -hmm. the attorney is maybe a more well-known attorney than the other one, because we see bullying for brand new attorneys. Mm -hmm. I see that all the time, and I tell you what, there are some darn good attorneys out there that have bar numbers that are a lot higher than mine, but I don't look at it and say, this is a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. If they pass a bar exam, they can do a good job for clients. Wow, and I, I haven't really thought of that from behind the scenes mm -hmm. as the attorneys to have it be you know, a fair playing field for everybody. Right. Not, yes. not allowing that bullying. And if you're on the bench, right. that you can recognize that and not let that happen in front of you at least. Right. And what I also think doesn't happen enough is threats to report basically conduct to the state bar. If someone says, you know, an attorney especially, mm -hmm. that's not true, they're a liar. I'll say, cool it, counsel, something like that. If it keeps it going to say, you keep this up, you're on the fast track to a disciplinary action. If we see conduct that is on the record, it's not a he said, mm -hmm. she said, like keep pushing video, my patience. We you're you're in a video, it. right. You've got no expectation of, well, that didn't count or this mm -hmm. is, you know, the level of professionalism has to be there. Would I enjoy that? Heck no, I would not enjoy that. But if it rises to the level, if you get a warning or two, what am I going to do? So I will refer cases if necessary for people for discipline with the state of our Nevada. I think that's your duty as a judge. I mean, it's, it's a rare situation, but I mean, right. you give a warning or two, people get it. The double wink might not be good enough. One more peep and this is what's gonna happen. So it sounds like you even right. are, are realizing you have to manage your courtroom yes. professionally. Yes. And not let it just be a big dramatic theater there. Correct, and that's why judicial demeanor is an important thing. And that's what I, mm -hmm. I've had, especially in landlord tenant cases, when I was sitting, running a decision mm -hmm. on that. We we're fighting on who took the toilet, why is there a hole in the wall, why is there mm -hmm. a pet stand everywhere? People, most people in small claims court don't have attorneys. Mm -hmm. So they're yelling, this cross talk, and the figure pointing, the, oh yeah, let's meet me in the hallway, we'll see who's the big man now. Those are horrible things that if that's happening, I have no problem, stop. Uh -huh. We are gonna hear, and one at a time too. There is not gonna be a clear record if you're talking like two-year-olds in the right. sandbox. Right. So, so that's, that's good experience to bring. It's like, I've it been there, I've had to wrangle them, that you can make sure your job gets done and the, there's solutions rather than just drama after drama after drama after drama. Right. So here's a, a hot topic that's out there that, so as a mental health provider, I put this out to the community and ask for them to give me questions. And a lot of them are really concerned about training and education and what kind of um, education do you get regarding high conflict, pathogenic parenting, domestic violence, addiction, so kind of enlighten everybody what what education or not just experience you all you family law attorneys have experience in this right. but like actual education on knowing what you're dealing with there a lot of it has to do with taking as many cle's as you possibly can cle's mm -hmm. continuing legal education mm -hmm. you have to do 13 credits a year that's peanuts mm -hmm. i was on the cle board up in reno for a few years i would mm -hmm. seen some of the best attorneys suspended because they didn't want to take enough cle's me i'm like overcharged. I want to do usually 30 to 40 a year. It only yeah. helps me be better. You know, as an attorney, as an advocate, you want to be the best you can be. So that's why I'm proud of my record with going to the family law convention uh -huh. and doing that. Plus I've got a dual major when I graduated in criminology and psychology. So okay. part of my brain works differently. So you have a bachelor's degree bachelor's in degree psychology? In psychology okay. and criminology. Okay. Yes. And then, uh, of course, law school and all so that. So it sounds like big on education and maintaining your education. You said earlier it is. the changes and what comes up and what new research comes up or what new new um, information to stay Correct. relevant and present in what's going on around, around you. Right when I was in college finishing up my bachelor's degree way back in the 90s. That's, that's a long time Some ago. Some people were 90s. just born then. I know, exactly, exactly, <laughs> but uh, I worked a couple different uh, youth care worker places, basically youth homes, where you work with families and uh, you know, people that are in these institutions, if you will, and you got to figure out why they're there, and you know, some of it, it is the truancy thing, they're kept on running away, bad crowds, mm -hmm. so they get you know, put into a, a state youth home, if you will, you know, 200 miles away, and you'd, you'd work with families, so I did that, and I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I knew that wasn't my calling for the rest of my life. But I said, I'm working with sex offenders. I'm working with people that have been abused, neglected, burned, picked on, disabilities, raped. I mean, there are just all kinds of walks of life. And you read files. And, was, and this, this is back in, I guess, the late 90s. 
And I said to myself, well, helping people is what I do. I've always liked to help people. That's like the teacher in me. Mm -hmm. I also did some student teaching way back in, I guess, the 90s as well. Mm -hmm. So then I said the next logical step for me is law school to figure out what I want to do. And oddly enough, I said, you know what? I always thought about getting out of Iowa and Michigan, where I'm from, Iowa originally, and let's go to Vegas to be a gaming attorney. That was initially my goal. Mm -hmm. However, in law school, I took a couple of family law classes and things, and I said, I really enjoy it. I think I can help people. And in 2004, when I moved out to here, uh, the two biggest areas of law, the booming practices, construction defect and family law. And family law was so it. you chose that one. And I chose, chose that construction one. Construction defects. And uh, yeah, I, I did that for a very short period of time. And I said, that is not my deal. Yeah. I'm looking at papers, third party plaintiff, fourth party defendant, patooey that. I'm going to do the family law thing. And then eventually you get good at it. So that's been my primary focus. I might have a civil case here and there every so often, but... It's just, it's my passion. So you're really focused on that family yes. law. And so yes. going in as a candidate for a family court position, right. like you couldn't have more focus. Correct. Like it's all about family law. Correct. And so some, some people can say, I've been an attorney for 20, 30 years. When you say, how many trials have you done? You might get a puzzled look. Me, I've done, I don't know how many days of trials. Some of them have multi-day trials. My longest trial I have right now, I'm on day 21. Wow. And uh, some judges, unfortunately, can't make a decision as fast as they should mm -hmm. and allow more leeway with you know testimony and things like that. But that goes with efficiency, just moving cases mm -hmm. along. But me, I've argued thousands of motions. I've argued in front of the Nevada Supreme Court. I've done several settlement conferences, uh, involvement with the state bar. I've been an arbitrator and a mediator with the state bar. And then, of course, Clark County Bar Association, I'm the immediate past president. So you're like behind the scenes. Front of the everything yeah. in the community and now right. considering or going for being on the bench right well but you've already been on the bench i've been on the so, bench right and okay. now doing it in a different format with the work my heart's into it certainly yeah. but you know even the civil stuff i mean you still have to make a decision whether you want to or not and then you write off your findings of fact conclusions of law so right. that's good experience to realize that and i will say this the first day i sat as uh, a small claims i had a celebrity that was a matchmaking service. It was a breach of contract thing. And I tell you what, there are some creepy people in Las Vegas <laughs> on matchmaking sites. And it goes with the safety sure. of people. So it was a unique experience, but you have two ears and one mouth. Attorneys like to talk. It's hard to listen. Mm -hmm. But when you do it, and you do it after several days of doing this thing, and since 2017, you get better at doing it day in, day out. So the, my whole point is I want to hit the ground running. And I think I'm there. So I am clearly so the best candidate. So here's a question, and, and I've talked to others about this. Looking at the system yes, and how family court is and the kids in these high-conflict divorce cases, if you get elected, are you? is there any goal or looking forward regarding the system? Yes. Too often, I think, in cases, children are not giving any input. Mm -hmm. Children need to be heard to some degree, and you have to determine the method, how that is to be done. Some people want to use the mediation center's child interview. I think a lot of children need a voice, not a choice. Mm -hmm. We hear those you know, buzz phrases and things, but there are ways to do it. And that's where outside professionals, you know, mental health professionals, therapists, and so forth, you do reports to the court. Do we rubber stamp them? No, we don't. But if they're the eyes and ears of what's happening in this case, Maybe I'm going to believe, you know, dad more than mom, but there's backup documents. If the children are scared or there's safety concerns, violence, all that stuff. Usually people would ask for some sort of outsource uh, evaluation or something to that effect or a brief focus assessment, as we call some of the, the minor issues. Not ignore that fact. You might need more than what one attorney says and the other attorney says. If you have to dig a little deeper, that's a solution that you absolutely can do. And also like the co-parenting or cooperative parenting classes. Some parents just don't know how to co-parent. They can parallel parent, you know, my time is mine and the heck with you and mm -hmm. your time is yours. That's an extreme situation, but there are ways to make a family work. Mm -hmm. And it's not about winning or losing, it's Even about what's it's best parallel. for families. Well, yeah, absolutely. And that's something you won't realize that until you might get a recommendation to say, I was going there, but now my decision, my thought is validated. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna look at someone to say, I know it all, I'm God, if you will. Mm -hmm. Some people that take the bench, they put on that black robe or whatever color they want to wear, they think it's quack science. No one else I've seen that. has that. input. Yes. Yeah. And I'm not or, afraid. Or the courts 
uh, view of the psychological well-being or the psychological effect of things is sometimes credited more than a psychologist's Correct. point of view regarding what's best for the child or what the child needs in their life. Right. Absolutely. So are you saying you'll take more of a humble perspective and like at least look at the professional yes. mental health provider's point of view when considering what kind of decision to make in these kinds of cases? Yes. Child custody decisions are difficult. We don't want to make them, you know, it's we're not fast food. We don't want the quickest decision, next, next, next. The quickest decision or the most popular decision might not be the best decision. That's kind of what I mean, my theme. But you have to read the pleadings. You have to see, is do I have all the information? If I put together a 1,000 piece puzzle and I have 800 pieces, I can see the barn and the you know crops or whatever, but I want to see the, I want to see the sun, the moon, all this stuff. I want to see the full picture. And reading papers from attorneys or just pro-pers, you might not get the full picture. So you absolutely need to know the best the full picture to make the best decision. And that's why some decisions are made from the bench. Even at trials, I see some judges after a long eight hour trial and it's 4.55. Hmm, I got dinner reservation at six. I want to get going. You know what? Here's what I'm going to do. Why would you not, if nothing else, take it under advisement, come back in a couple weeks or say, you have a written decision, 30 to 45 days, done. You can't take a fast food approach with Resolving disputes, or make like an impulsive decision because you're in a rush. What? Well, or maybe you're hungry. Maybe you got a decision in a rush. Well, okay. It's not fair to the people that are pay, that are there, whether they have attorneys or not, to make a, a decision that might not be ground in law effect. Right. Right. So. And it. So looking at the system and what you would change in the system, how would you? You were talking about efficiency and be prepared and manage your courtroom and all those kind of great points, but how do you? implement those things in the system versus just your court. Judges have the meetings and things mm -hmm. and the monthly meetings and some of that stuff, especially with the newer judges, it's a scary system that we have this election cycle. There are, there are going to be 26 judges on the bench in family court, six brand new from the new seats and four brand new from the retiring judge. That's 10 out of 26. So they're going to be brand almost new. Almost half the judges. Yes are going to be brand new judges on brand the new. family court. So obviously, kind of the old law school study buddy groups, whatever, mm -hmm. if there are 10 brand new judges, which there will be, you owe it to yourself to say, okay, don't freak out. <laughs> How was your week? What worked? What didn't? And learn, learn, and one more thing, learn. There are ways to do your job better. Some people are better communicators. Some people are better, you know, with their calendar. You have to figure out what works. And also just the mentoring thing. I've got friends on the third floor at Family Court. I want to make sure judges that have been doing this for 10 plus years, they're doing something right, especially the ones that do not draw challengers. They are doing something right. They're highly rated by the RJ poll, all that. You have to have a mentor, which is important, and but does, you have to also be a leader. Do new judges have to have a mentor? Or you're saying it would be best, it's not actually required? I'm not sure, but I think that there is some, there should be, if there's not, some sort of mentoring huh. component. I believe that there is. I mean, other judges might sit down in your courtroom and kind of do it that way. Uh -huh. But I think you owe it to yourself to say, you know what, if I'm dark this day, if I don't have a trial that's settled, if I have half a day or whatever, I have no problem sitting second fiddle just to be eyes and ears and just say, I'm, I'm, I want to be a sponge. That's a really good idea. I want to take it in. I want to take it in. And if you don't take it in, yeah, you'll, you'll get backed up with maybe evenings and weekends initially. But don't you want to be the best judge? I do not want to learn and have a very steep learning curve. Right. Putting on the black robe, are we on the record? Okay, case number, blah, 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 blah. It's scary. And the first time I was, again, on the bench in Las Vegas, it was a trial. I knew nothing about the case <laughs> other than what I read prior to coming on the bench. And if that's not trial by fire, I don't know what is. <laughs> You're like, you know. learn it now. It, uh, yeah, exactly. Wow. So, and it was, I love that mentoring idea. I love that idea and even you know as therapists they don't they don't just throw you out go do therapy now you graduated right you have to have somebody who has been doing this for years and years to consult right. with absolutely and that makes you a better therapist because you're learning from the wiser person who went through the bumps in in the road already right so that that gosh that it, you're just saying you would voluntarily i would do that, absolutely but that yeah. it might actually be something to implement is it is a really right. good idea. That's uh, yeah. a really good idea. Because you owe it to yourself in the community as a public servant to be the best person that you can. You know, especially, you know, 
people are going to talk. There's going to be 10 new judges for sure, and perhaps more if some of the judges that drew challengers don't get reelected. Everyone's going to be talking about here's what works and here's what doesn't. If they don't do that and they're kind of, you know, just, just you know, not being honest with themselves, there's a problem. I think people owe it to themselves to talk. And I think some of the more senior judges that are, you know, experienced and on the bench, they should want to see people succeed. You're your brother or sister on the bench. It's not like they have to compete with each other. Absolutely. It says, it says we want to have an efficient court system because otherwise, mm -hmm. if you get that three, four, five months into it and you just don't have a clue, the peremptory challenges, the Supreme Court's going to get a whiff of what's going on in that department team. Right. You know, that stuff, well, I don't know about him. I don't want to have that ability to say, I have some explaining to do, as they say. Mm -hmm. But uh, hit the ground running is important. Bring in the experience to the bench, the judicial demeanor. You can't get that just on sides, uh, sides on the side of the road. You have to be that person that's passionate. If you don't have that passion, you might want to rethink the election. And I guess with your devotion to family law, that's pretty dang passionate. It is. So as we kind of close up, if folks want to learn more about you or contact you or, you know, just kind of watch what you're doing, give where can they do that? Okay. It's uh, jasonstoffelforjudge.com. I'm also active on Facebook. Uh, you'll see me around different community events. Uh, get out there, be, be civic minded, see what's out there, whether it's a, a women's group, men's group, whatever the case might be. Care. It is a very important job to be a judge. When people vote, make your vote be informed. That is the best message I absolutely can tell people. And check out some of the opponents that are in my race or other races. Figure out who the best person is for that job. It is a big issue, especially for primary voting. And I have a primary. June 9th is the primary. Make sure your voice is heard loud and early because guess what? That ship could sail by if you just say, Oh, I didn't vote, and then you have no right to complain about who's on the bench. Right. And judges in these nonpartisan races, far down the ballot, especially a presidential year, they're not given the weight that they deserve. Right. It's important. And it's it is serious. These are people's lives. Absolutely. You guys are in charge of people's lives. So getting out there and, and getting informed and trying to really make sure you pick a quality person. <laughs> Correct. That that sounds like a responsibility that we have. Maybe it's not our right. family law case, but someone we know is going to be in front of it. Most definitely, there are six year terms. It's not two years, mm -hmm. we're not happy, four years, we're not happy. Six years, that's longer than a presidency, mm -hmm. a presidential term. So calling it what it is, six years on the bench is too long if you're not committed right. and, right. and doing, doing your job well. Right. If you don't do your job well, you have no business getting voted in, but there are people for 150 bucks and you meet your qualifications, you get on the ballot. But I think with the course of today and going to my website, you can see that I'm the best and most qualified person for family court judge, department T. Vote for Jason Stoffel, family court department T. All right, thanks for talking to us today. Happy to be here. I appreciate your time. And if we ever want to call you back, I know you're willing to talk some more. So I, I appreciate it so much. Absolutely. Thanks for talking to us today. Happy to be here. Thank you thanks. so much. Awesome. Thank you.